In previous videos, we've talked about Coulomb's Law, and how, in the late 1700s, Charles Augustin de Coulomb, pardon my French pronunciations, he discovered that the force experienced between two stationary, electrically charged particles is proportional to the product of the charges themselves, and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. That's not the full story, however, because, as experiments would show, actually calculating the exact electrostatic force between the two particles requires this proportionality constant, a K, Coulomb's constant, which was found to be around 8.99 times 10 to the ninth power, and a bit of dimensional analysis can tell us that we should expect the units of this to be newton meters squared per coulomb squared. I'd like to take some time to talk a bit about this K constant here, because it has a rather interesting history. If you look at most formal reiterations of Coulomb's Law, you might notice that, a lot of the time, this K is replaced with a more complicated term, this 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, or epsilon naught, where epsilon naught is a different constant known as the vacuum permittivity constant, or the electric constant, hence why it begins with epsilon, the, the Greek equivalent of the letter E. Now, despite how different they may seem, both of these formulas, both versions of the formula here, are completely equal, and you can check this with a calculator, just keeping in mind the fact that this epsilon naught constant has a value of around 8.85 times 10 to the negative 12, with similarly determined units of coulomb squared per newton meters squared. So, students will often wonder, uh, what exactly this whole term here, with 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, they'll wonder what exactly this term means, where it comes from, and why we use it, despite how unwieldy it may seem on first glance. Now, so, the simple answer that most textbooks and professors will give you is that this version of the formula later proves to be very useful when it comes to simplifying important expressions and derivations. And while it's true that this is kind of the reason why this form stuck around and became as standardized as it is, that's not a very satisfying explanation, nor does it really clarify the original intuition behind where this came from. Early scientists came up with this term as part of an attempt to figure out the true nature of the inverse square law that you can see reoccurring in so many physical expressions. In terms of distance, the electrostatic force between two charges only cares about the distance between the particles, not direction or any other variables, just the distance between them. So let's say we've got two charged particles right here, right? And there's a distance r between them. Now, as long as we don't change the value of the charges, the force experienced between these two particles should be the same as long as the distance is kept the same, no matter what the positions actually are. So let's say we've got uh, another charged particle right here, or, or let's just say we move the charged particle up a bit in, in kind of a spherical pattern. So if the distance is still the same, it's still the same r value, it's just that now we're looking at it in a slightly different position. And uh, we could add some more charges, uh, like let's add another charge right here, same distance, just in a different relative position to the one that we're holding in place here. And what we'll find is that if we keep doing this, if we keep going around the, the circle basically, and adding more uh, charges and, and analyzing the position here, we start to see that for any r value, we basically have this sphere around the one we've kept stationary, where no matter where the second charge is along this sphere, the force hasn't changed. The force stays the same. You basically have a perfect three-dimensional sphere surrounding either particle where the other charge can be located at, and the magnitude of the electrostatic force stays the same. If we bring the charge closer, then we'll have a new sphere. It's still uh, that is valid for a new force at that point in time. And now there are fewer points at which the force can be equal. If we move the charge further away, then the sphere of points at which uh, the force will be the same is now a little larger, again surrounding one of the charges. 
And just to be clear here, we could say this about either charge, like I could just as easily draw the sphere around this left charge instead of the right one. Because again, the distance between the two charges is all that matters. It's not as if just one of the two charges is particularly special or anything like that. This is just my attempt at visualizing the phenomenon. But for this reason, it occurred to early scientists that this seemingly random inverse square law might be a manifestation of some sort of inverse surface area law, where the larger the surface area is surrounding the charge, maybe that has something to do with how the magnitude of the force decreases. After all, the formula for the surface area of any sphere is known to be 4 times pi times r, or the radius of the sphere, and Coulomb's law does have that r squared to the denominator. If we think of this formula not as being the inversion of the square of the distance, but rather as the inverse of some surface area being affected by the particle at a given distance, a spherical surface area, that is, then all of a sudden, this formula starts to feel a bit more intuitive to visualize and understand. As we analyze larger distances, with larger spherical surface areas as a result, then the charge gets weaker as some manifestation of that. And that is how some early scientists decided to look at it. So, we decide to rewrite the original Coulomb's Law to include a 4 pi factor in the denominator. Since this will go side by side with the r squared over here, we basically have an entire term in the denominator of the equation that's essentially equal to a sphere's surface area. Now, in order to keep the term equal, we then define a new constant, the permittivity constant, and solve for its value. And now we've ended up with a brand new way to represent the law. Once we start getting into other important formulas in electricity in later videos, we'll start to get into why this version of Coulomb's Law ultimately proves to be so useful. But for now, I hope that this clarifies a bit of the logic and where this version of the formula can come from.